Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to be with you this morning. Also, I'm uh, I'm dealing from yesterday with a big cold, like a kind of flu. So I think I will give you all my energy this uh, morning for me and just go back to bed after a while. But uh, no, that's a pleasure to be with you because it's always uh, it's always interesting for me to discuss with uh, people from a scientific background that I do not know very well, which is the case for you. So um, I guess we will have an interesting uh, interesting discussion. So um, as a short introduction, um, I see myself as an interdisciplinary researcher. I have a background in uh, behavioral medicine, digital health, data science because of digital health. And also I'm working in, um, in a Spanish institution, which is uh, really focused on planetary health and climate change. So I'm putting my skills into this, uh, into this domain a lot. Um, you can reach me easily uh, with this uh, email address. I'm uh, pretty active on Twitter with, when I'm not uh, dealing with the flu. And uh, on the Open Science Framework, I have a lot of material, uh, code, for example, on R that are related to what we will discuss today. So if you want to, to check my profile, uh, you can go there and see like the different codes and data that I'm using for the, for the different studies that we are working on. Um, just to tell you also that I have two screens, so I can see the chat at the same time. So if you want to if you want to ask questions directly into the chat, please feel free to do it. I will try to to check the two screens uh, at the same time, and we can do something more interactive. So the this first talk is connecting to connected to a second talk by Olga Persky that will discuss a bit more the 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 design the research design that are related to to my talk, which is focused on time series and complexity. Um, basically, the point is to help you understand how I went from the collection of what we call high resolution data with digital technology, so smartphone, activity monitors, etc., to hydrographic analysis, time series, and complex system theories. So I will um, I will show you how I switch from one topic to another over time and why they are all connected, and I think very important for uh, for uh, for you. So let's start with the, this concept of high resolution and uh, by taking two pictures that are speaking for themselves. Um, a, it's about physical activity. So for example, on your right, you have like a traditional uh, study um, investigating the change in physical activity during a program. And as you can see, I guess you can see my, um, my mouth on the screen. The, this study were using like a traditional uh, self-report assessment, so a questionnaire in baseline, one month, three months, and six months. And on the left, you have also a randomized control trial, um, but a more recent one, where the participants were asked to wear uh, Fitbit during all the, the duration of the trial. And as you can see, like the two pictures uh, are, very, are telling us like a very different story with a lot of um, dynamical features on the left, a lot of things like uh, happening, and a way more stable picture on the right. So I can give you another example in the field of uh, depression, for example. On the right, you have same things, a traditional assessment of depression with a questionnaire. So in acute phases uh, at six months, 12 months, and uh, 18 months, which is like pretty stable view of uh, depression. And on the left, a more recent one with only one participant rating his own uh, depressiveness over time. And here again, as you can see, like the two, uh, the two story are very different with a lot of non-linearities on one side and something pretty stable on the right. So when I'm talking about high resolution, it's uh, exactly that, basically. It's observing things that can change from one day to another or even within day. So such as like your aging behaviors, your sleep quality, uh, your stress, obviously, like a lot of different uh, psychological or behavioral indicators. That could be the case for symptoms too. If you have like low back pain, for example, they can change a lot. And when you try to assess it at high resolution with um, smartphone application or activity monitors, uh, you can get like a very, very, very different picture of um, a, a process of change over time. So here it's what I'm, I'm telling you by high resolution. Um, so there is some advantage from going to low to high resolution. The first one is that we can now have a view in real time of what is happening. So it might be really obvious for you because as I told you, I'm not sure about the, the exact work and research that you are doing. 
But uh, here, basically, it's a picture of um, our participant during a randomized control trial um, in San Diego during the, the first um, stay-at-home measure in California, so the first uh, lockdown. And basically, we were uh, able during this time to, to check in real time how participants were adapting to the situation. And we were able like, to, to give some like, specific and tailored advice to, to each of them at the exact time of the data collection. So basically, like, the activity monitor was recording something. And just the day after, I, I, it, it was possible to access to the data. Something which is very important also in regards of this uh, seminary about tuning is that when your X axis is time, um, you have a way better understanding of the contextual features. So here, for example, we can really ask the question about what is happening here and here, why there is two peak in depressiveness uh, for this participant. We can come back retrospectively to this specific time or in real time, we can directly ask or reach out to the participant to understand what is going on and why we do observe um, something different. Same here, we have a pretty, not stable, but still around the mean, there is no change over time with a, high of a lot of variability for this participant. Here it's for physical activity, steps per day. And we can see that starting here, there is a lot of change. There is a big, um, a big level up on the physical activity level. Then there is two sudden decrease. Then there is another one, so same during, let's say it's 100 days, so let's say 80 days, there is nothing happening. And then there is a big period of uh, burgeoning change. And it's very interesting to, to, to map this change with the contextual features and what is going on at this uh, specific time. So here I'm, I'm shifting uh, toward high resolution to high geographic analysis because the point also with uh, time series and high resolution is that you can now um, do statistics at not only the group level, but also the individual, um, the individual level. So here, for example, you have only one participant rating his depressiveness uh, every day. Um, and you have 170, sorry, um, observation for only one participant. So indeed, it's a lot of statistical power to uh, fit some specific statistical model for this person. So here it's important to understand when you shift to a low to high resolution is that your statistical power is not only the number of observations per participant, but um, no, sorry, it's not the number of participants in itself, but the number of observations per participant. So here, let's say that you have 10 participants, but you measure this part, you measure only uh, once. It's like a cross-sectional panel study. So you take 10 participants, one measurement, you have 10 observations. But if you take uh, one participant uh, only, but 10 observations, you have the same statistical number, but with not the same uh, the same number of participants. I think it's relatively easy to understand, so I, I do not spend too much time on that. But if it's not, please tell me in the chat and I can uh, I can rephrase. So basically, the point is, with high resolution, we can accumulate way more data at the individual level. And because we accumulate data at the individual level, we can do statistics at the individual level. We are not obliged to, to pull the participant um, together. So this is pretty interesting to capture a lot of heterogeneity because depending on the outcome you are interested in, um, let's say like um, sleep, for example, there is a lot of geographic uh, features in sleep. Some, some of you need to sleep only, um, only six hours uh, per day, other needs nine hours or 10 hours. Uh, some of you can stay uh, out of the, the bed uh, at uh, 3 a.m. I think it's uh, the case of one of the one of the, the attendee today. And um, and some others cannot. They need a nap. So we have a lot of different habits. So it's very interesting to not have only a group view on this kind of process, but also like a tailored individual view. Um, here it's to give you like a very like practical example of what it looks like. It's, um, it's a paper we published recently with some colleagues. And in this paper, we were interested to model the association between sleep on one night and physical activity the day after, and the opposite. So basically, how your physical activity on one day impact your following night, and how your night impact your physical activity the day after. And here you can see that the forest plot represents uh, individual participants. So here it's one participant, two participants, three participants. Each line is a different participant. 
And here it's a good example of this heterogeneity because you can see that for some participants, in this case, it's uh, sleeping longer is associated with more physical activity the day after. Uh, for other, it's not significant. And for other participants, it's uh, the opposite direction. It's a negative association. So again, uh, it would have been possible for me to take another example. It's just to 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 show you like all different processes when you split it participant per participant, you can have a lot of different uh, results and a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, obviously, this hydrographic analysis and the way of not putting participants together is related to all these things around precision medicine uh, with the objective of uh, tailoring the treatments and tailoring the intervention for, for the participant. Something yep, also sorry, which is, sorry to yeah. interrupt. They, I think someone has a question. Jeff was going to ask something. He had his hand up. Um, okay, oh, sorry, right. I cannot see it. Please, Jeff. Yes, Jeff, you want to ask something? Oh, no, sorry, I just clicked the wrong button. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, so I continue. But please interrupt me if, uh, if you need, no problem at all. Uh, because I, 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 I haven't been able to, to see it. Uh, again, I have the chat open if you want to tip something in the chat. So um, here also, it's a more like philosophical piece that uh, we wrote with a colleague that might be part actually of this seminary because he's working a lot with the uh, MC, Eric Eckler. And in this, uh, in this paper, we explain that uh, during hydrographic analysis, hydrographic research is also another way of building knowledge because most of the time we are in this big data paradigm. So we are trying to do like a big uh, like epidemiological study on 10,000 participants. And then we will um, basically like assume that what we observe at the group level can be applied for each of us here uh, individually. And actually shifting this paradigm is also very important uh, and very relevant in a lot of contexts because Sometimes you can also build knowledge the other way around by first focusing on individuals, building um, interesting knowledge on individuals, then trying to identify cluster. So, okay, for example, for me and Jeff, it works this way. For Max and Wilson, it works this way. And, uh, and then produce uh, collective knowledge. It's also something that you can find in uh, maybe like more the HCI world with um, all the stuff around self-experimentation, and uh, personalize uh, personal science and all these uh, these things. So, um, okay, so now we've seen that because we have a smartphone in the pocket every day and we are wearing this kind of uh, activity monitors at the wrist, we can get very high resolution data. Uh, it will be a shame to only rely on means. So it's it's very like it's very relevant to keep this data uh, as raw as possible and to see the fluctuation and to try to understand this fluctuation. Because with the high resolution, we have way more observation per participant. We can run a statistical model that are specific to each participant. And so we can have like a way more tailored view on what is happening for, again, symptoms, fluctuation, the effectiveness of an intervention, behavior change, any kind of different things. And in practice, these different things are really related to the topic of time series, which is also really related to the, the the, the topic of complex system theories. So let's jump into this uh, second part of the talk. And again, I'm watching the chat, so if you need something, let me know. Um, time series and complexity. So just to, because again, I don't know if we're on the same page or not, but time series, it's not that difficult. It's just a specific organization of the data, of the data through time. So here, for example, you have the same participant, participant one, participant one, participant one, et cetera the number of uh, steps, so physical activity per day, and uh, the date. So it means that basically, um, like you have a long format of the data. Um, it's, it's a time series, no, not more difficult than that. There is two articles that you might want to that you might want to read if you are interested by this topic because obviously in 45 minutes it's difficult to to give you like a full picture but it's the um, I'm I'm presenting you like some of the results from these two uh, these two papers so it's just to to cite it in uh, in the introduction because the the rest of my talk is based on this uh, on these papers. Um, basically, what is a complex system? A complex system is 
um, something that have specific properties. So there are a lot of different way of um, of uh, defining a complex system, but you can define a complex system by these three different uh, adjectives, not adjectives, sorry, but properties that you can observe with time series. So it's why it's very it's very related. So basically, it's the memory. So each complex system has a long memory, meaning that what you do today is based on what you did before. And sometimes you can have like very, very long uh, history across years, etc. So when you develop, for example, a specific disease, sometimes it's might, it might be due to your day-to-day -day behavior during 10, 15 years. Um, complex systems are made of regime shift. So it means that change in complex systems can be nonlinear and can be very uh, abrupt, so you can have like very like uh, rapid change in a process. So also why it's important to look at it at high resolution because you you do not want to miss something which is happening. And here it's um, what we call sometimes the butterfly effect. Um, complex systems are sensitive to the to the initial conditions. So it means that two very small differences at the beginning uh, could lead to two very different things. So Let's try to, to go through the different properties uh, that link time series and complexity in a bit more uh, practical way. So here, for example, you have the um, autocorrelation plot. So autocorrelation are very important, uh, very important uh, statistical features of time series. It's basically the first thing that you need to check in, uh, when you have a time series. And an autocorrelation, it's whether your uh, variable is correlated with the past value of the same variable. So whether your sleep quality today is correlated with your sleep quality one day ago, two day ago, three day ago, four day ago, etc. Or same things for your symptoms, for example. Uh, whether um, whether your uh, let's say your uh, I don't know your headache uh, is correlated to previous experience of headache uh, in time. So here you have two very different uh, autocorrelation for two different items that I've been measured for only one participant several times per day. I feel down and I'm angry. And as you can see, for I feel down, there is a lot of autocorrelation. So here it's the lag, it's the number of measurements. So there is 1,000 measurements, so it's quite a lot. Um, so over months, it means that feeling down at a specific point might be explained by a feeling down uh, way before in time. Right. Um, while for I am angry, we can see that there is few, very few autocorrelation. So it means that being angry at uh, one point is not really related to being angry uh, in the past because like it's, it's, there is less complexity around that. So the, um, yeah, something which is important in time series and related to this complexity is that for some system that you want to observe, so depression is one here on the left, that could be sleep quality, that could be again, anything you are interested in. Something that you are observing today may be the maybe um, like a process of a very long time, uh, a very long time process. Here you have another example. Each line is a participant. Uh, when it's red, it's a negative assertion, and when it's blue, it's a positive assertion, and it's between total sleep time and physical activity. So what you can see is that for most participants the process is uh, focused on the first time lag. So it means that when you do not sleep, uh, when you sleep less on one day, you do more physical activity the day after. Well, it makes sense because you have more time to be active, etc. So it's maybe like a competition between the two behaviors. But something you can observe is that for some participants, it's really only the previous night that matter. But for others, as you can see, we can, we can see like red cases um, up to one week. So in this case, it means that there is a longer autocorrelation uh, in this uh, in these associations, and uh, it means that there is a kind of history of uh, poor sleep accumulation for some participant that only after a specific uh, uh, time will have an impact on physical activity. So it's two again, it's two different way of looking at how time influence uh, things. Um, I'm also linking this concept of uh, temporal autocorrelation with something that we all know, which is the concept of resilience. And here again, resilience is quite of a generic concept. I think we all have an idea about what it means. 
Um, but it's very relevant to study resilience through time series and complex system theories. It's uh, what it is explained in this paper if you want to read it. And for example, in some cases, higher temporal autocorrelation can be seen as an indicator of fragility. I explain myself. If, for example, your um, sleep is highly correlated with your past sleep, you can get trapped in a kind of negative feedback loop. So it means that if you have a poor sleep, because your sleep is very correlated over time, if you have a poor sleep on one night, you, are, you will have a poor sleep the night after, a poor sleep the night after, etc., etc., and you will be trapped into this uh, this um, this kind of feedback loop. So again, just to give you a, like a practical example, and something you can um, you have to remember about this um, this autocorrelation is that basically like your current uh, health state is uh, better understood as an emergent things from a lifespan history of interaction event. So it's really basically like the level of autocorrelation over time here in high field down that could be predictive of a, a state of depression some month or some years later. So here again, I'm telling it in other words, looking at how things interact at high resolution from one day to another can also explain you like way more longer uh, time frame health issues such as developing a depression. So by looking at daily variation in some things, Sometimes you can predict uh, the onset of a specific depression months or years later. So here it was for the first thing. So uh, complex systems are characterized by uh, memory. So it means that the state of a complex system on one day is related to um, this uh, same uh, complex system before in time. And you can only observe these things with time series. And the second one is about regime shift. So as I tell you, uh, as I told you, uh, complex systems can change very uh, in very abrupt ways, and um, and also looking at time series to observe change is the best uh, is the best solution. So basically, you have two different kinds of change when you are looking at time uh, to time series, and it's related to a second very important concept in time series analysis, which is non-stationary. Um, and let's let's look at the picture. Here you have a time series fluctuating around the blue uh, the blue lines, and we could say that this uh, time series is stationary. There is no specific change over time. There is a natural fluctuation, and um, things are not changing. Here you have a time series which is changing, but in a very specific way because the fluctuations are always relatively similar around the mean level. But there is an increasing trend in this one, and then there is a decreasing slope. So it's what we call um, a change in mean, but not a change in variance. And here at the opposite, you do not have a change in mean, so there is no like increasing slope or decreasing slope, but you have a change in variance. So it means that you have a lot of variability, and this variability decreases over time. So let's think about, um, for example, um, stress. Here you will have someone that have a fluctuating stress level around the mean without specific change. And you will have some someone that do not have a lot of variation in stress, but uh, with a stress level which is uh, increasing over time and then decreasing. And here you will have someone that have a very high variation of stress at the beginning, and then that will decrease over time, which could be actually a positive outcome of an intervention. Because for mental health, it depends for which outcome. But for mental health, having higher variability uh, most of the time, it's not uh, it's not great, and you want to decrease this variability uh, during intervention. For physical activity, actually, it might be the opposite. We need more uh, more studies, but the more your physical activity is, uh, the the more variance you have in your physical activity, the more resilient you could be. So it really depends from one topic to another. But again, here it's just different way of characterizing characterizing a change in uh, a time series. And obviously, you can have both. You're gonna have like uh, a lot of variability during the increasing trend, then uh, slowing down, and then uh, like uh, like you can mix the the change in variance or the change in uh, in mean. Um, the point. So again, these different things. Imagine that you are not measuring things at high resolution. You are only taking measurement, uh, let's say every week or every three months. You will miss a lot of observation. You you will not be able to characterize all this change. 
while in complex system theories, this different change can tell you a lot of things about what is going on. Um, so the first thing is that beyond just checking the, uh, the change in mean, in complex system theory, um, changing, for example, from one type of variance to another is also a significant change that needs to be interpreted. So it's more like uh, characterized as phase transition. So you have like your time series and you will try to split this time series in uh, different phases that might be um, that might indicate like some specific change in the context or in an intervention. Something also we we are observing more and more is that successful treatment. So when you want to deliver an intervention, uh, are more effective. So it's it's this one, sorry, um, but the two are related. So successful treatment, they are more effective when you observe a specific change in the time series. So let's say that you have a very rigid process. Uh, again, let's speak about like uh, sleep quality. So you always you are always fluctuating around a specific mean of sleep quality. And with an intervention, we can destabilize a bit this process. So um, we can create like new variation by it, uh, by implementing an intervention, by asking the participant to do something else. And this specific period of destabilization are very important to observe because most of the time it's related to another concept that we will discuss after, which is early warning signals. So it's it really means that okay something is is starting to happen and uh, we need to uh, we need to pay attention to it and maybe someone could be very responsive to an intervention at this specific time. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. I told you I'm just gonna sleep after this uh, this talk. Okay. Last one is um, the sensitivity to initial conditions, and which is also related to the the so-called uh, butterfly effect. And it's very important because it's um, basically the properties from complex systems that can tell us if we can predict or not something. And as you as you know, I guess, I think it's the same for you. Uh, prediction is really a big deal now in digital health and all these uh, these things around that. So it's exactly what I was telling you. It's within a complex system. Uh, the game is to understand what's the predictive reason. So here it's the physical activity time series during the during the lockdown in San Diego when I was there. And when we are at this point, we might want to try to predict. What will be the what will be the trend? So an increasing trend that we would like to reach, or something stable that will not come back to the to the pre uh, pre pandemic level. Um, so yeah, in in a lot of different cases, it's interesting to to try to predict uh, uh, what will happen. To give you again, sorry, another practical example. Uh, I'm working on project right now where we try to predict um, COPD exacerbation. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it's a very unstable disease with some symptom exacerbation, so that are like very abrupt. And we want to see if we can, based on the movement from the activity monitors, some days before, uh, observe this uh, early warning signals of uh, of uh, COPD exacerbation. So, um, very briefly, um, time series can be very different depending on the concept you are observing. So physical activity, depression. You can remember the two differences between I am hungry and I feel done that were like very, very different in the autocorrelation plot. And depending on, in, on the noise that you observe in this time series, so there is different type of noise that are related to different theories in physics. I don't want to, to go there this morning. Um, some series are very easy to predict while others are very difficult to predict. So it's in, in important to have in mind. And something which is interesting is that um, actually you can, there is like packages on R that, um, that can help you um, compute whether you can expect doing prediction or not from the, from the, the system you are observing. So here the, uh, the authors from the paper I cited before um, are trying to see how predictive is I feel down and how predictive is I'm angry. So if you have a score around one with this specific computation, again, I do not enter into the detail here, but if you want, I can give you more, uh, more, um, more information on that. Um, a perfect line around one would mean that we can, uh, we can predict 
how a system will change over time very easily. So here we can think about, uh, let's say, maybe it will not be one, but still it would be important. We can think about uh, weight for a baby or the size of a kid. Like we know for sure that there is a, there is an increasing size over time. We know this rate based on previous observation. So it's pretty it's pretty easy to predict uh, at least for some at least for a short period of time how uh, size will uh, will uh, will change. For high field down, you can see that at the beginning there is some predictive value value up to a time uh, time lag of four or five. So it might be the number of observation and number of day. And then it's fluctuating around zero. So it means that, yeah, it's possible to make some prediction. So it's possible by observing the past to, to predict how someone will feel tomorrow, one day after, or maybe two days after. But then after some days, this uh, prediction capacity is decreasing to zero. And for I am hungry, for example, it's so messy in the noise that it seems that we cannot predict over time I'm hungry. So again, it's just to tell you that uh, because we are all very excited about uh, about doing prediction. Uh, time series is really related to prediction because you are observing the past, you are observing trends, change in variance. So, you know, it's natural to, to, to try to make prediction based on what you observed before. But depending on what you are observing, uh, again, you might be interested in a lot of different outcomes. So I'm, I'm not sure to, I, I can't give you like all the different examples, but if it's a psychological process, if it's a physiological process, let's say weight, uh, blood pressure, uh, if it's like a um, behavioral process, so eating behaviors or anything else, um, you might not have the same uh, predictive uh, capacity. And like complex system theories and complex system methods can tell us a bit more about what is predictive or not. Um, so yes, while time series and complexity are related, they are related because Basically, complex systems are made from specific uh, properties that are memory. So it means that your health state, you, uh, your health state today is de uh, depends on your uh, health uh, before. Regime shift, your health today can change very quickly. So like me, for example, yesterday, two days ago, I was doing like a big hike, a big hike and I was like uh, perfectly fine. And yesterday I was in my bed all the day. And uh, this is uh, there is a lot of sensitivity to initial conditions, so it means that um, basically things can change in a lot of different way, and for most outcomes, it's difficult to predict in long term uh, what is going on. And these properties you can only observe them uh, through time series analysis. So again, it's why the two are very uh, very connected. Let's take an example, a very concrete one. So. Um, you might have already like read some article about this concept of early warning signals. So basically, early warning signals it's um, when you can observe like some specific fluctuation in the time series that can indicate you that something is going on and that some things could change. You have early warning signals for a lot of different things coming from a financial crisis. So you can find a lot of articles in the literature checking, for example, at the, the, like the time series of debt or the time series of like the, the dollars and predicting, uh, predicting different events from, from that. You can predict, um, you can predict some symptoms exacerbation. So, for example, in asthma, there is a lot of uh, study that I already used like early warning signals. And uh, here, I will show you an application of early warning signals for activity uh, activity monitor. And I think it's the the first uh, the first paper doing that. So it's a paper we published one year ago in um, on less than one year ago in plus one. And we try to apply this different concept of time series complexity early warning signals to the characterization of uh, physical activity change over time. So we we used uh, the mathematical basis of uh, this paper, which is basically uh, offering some algorithm to compute early warning signals from a time series. So I will try to explain you uh, very quickly how it looks like. So. Here you have um, here you have a behavior. So let's say it's physical activity. You have a first part of uh, this behavior, which is pretty stable. So you are doing you are doing between uh, level two and level five of this behavior. 
Then there is a big period of instability, so the variance uh, increase a lot, and then there is a second stable, stable state. In complex system theory, uh, people have observed from a long time that when you have a change in a system, most of the time this change is preceded by this specific period of uh, instability. So that can be the case for financial crisis, for example. Uh, before a financial crisis, you can observe like specific uh, instability in some factors uh, that also work for civilizations. So there is some papers at a very like bigger scale looking at uh, fluctuation in some indication, uh, some indicators, some outcome related to the healthiness of a civilization. And before changing from one state to another, there is instability. And you can compute this instability in the time series uh, with a score which is called dynamic complexity. So basically, here the score of dynamic complexity represents the variance in the time series, if we speak like very, very simply. So yeah, there is not a lot of variance, so dynamic complexity is close to zero. Uh, there is, uh, it's not really complex. There is not a lot of fluctuation. Here we can see that there is uh, a beginning of high oscillation, so the dynamic complexity will increase to reach a peak, which corresponds to uh, the highest level of variation within a time series. And then there is a reorganization, so the time series come back to the to like a relatively stable state and the dynamic complexity score decreased. So basically this score represents the amount of variance, it's a bit more complex than that, but you can just remember that, the amount of variance you have in the time series. And we can use it actually as an early warning signals to, to make some predictions. So let's look at it. In, um, in this paper, we were interested in predicting significant uh, changes in physical activity level in participants to a weight loss uh, program. So first we took the, um, the physical activity time series. So here it's the number of steps per day for uh, one participant. And we applied a kind of uh, easy machine learning algorithm to detect some specific change in this time series. So here we define the change as um, plus 30% comparing to the median level of physical activity or minus 30% during at least a week. So for us, doing more physical activity, which is the blue uh, triangle, or doing less physical activity, the orange triangle, is doing more or less 30% of your activity level during at least one week. And as you can see here, so for this participant, we can see that nothing is happening during the like 80 year first day. Then there is a sudden gain. Then there is a sudden loss. Then it's fluctuating around this level. Then again, a sudden loss, sudden gain, sudden loss, sudden gain, sudden loss, etc. So there is quite a lot of nonlinear non -linear change for this participant. There is a lot of things happening for this participant. And the, the objective was to predict before these things happen, uh, these student gains and losses based on the observation of the time series before. And actually, we, we have been relatively successful because in this paper, we, so we computed the dynamic complexity score, so it's basically the amount of variability in the time series, and we observed that there were a significant correlation between the amount of fluctuation in the time series in the three days preceding um, a loss in physical activity. So in other terms, with like 45% um, accuracy, we were able to predict a sudden decrease in physical activity based on the fluctuation three days before. But it was not working for sudden gain, which is quite interesting because there is another paper that did the same for depression. And uh, actually, it was the opposite. They were able to predict a significant increase in depression, but not significant decrease. And same things, they were able to do it like based on the observation of the fluctuation in the time series two to three days uh, before. So just an example again um, of these different things. And um, maybe just um, let me tell you that at the beginning, I was absolutely not interested in, uh, in, uh, in mathematics, time series and complexity. But when I started to do a postdoc in digital health and when I started to work with this time series, Actually, I had to find tools that can help me understand and explain uh, what was going on in the in this change over time. So it's why I came to time series, and because I came to time series, I did not have the choice to 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 come to complexity 
because the two are very related. So um, I could give you like uh, an hundred uh, of example of different example of what we can do with time series analysis and complexity. But here, for example, it's an application of this concept of early warning signals to detect something that is going on in the time series, ideally before these things uh, occur. So here it was a uh, change in the physical activity level, but you can do it with a lot of different uh, processes, like depression, for example. There is a lot of research in the in psychiatry. Uh, let me just give you some um, some articles if you want to to dig into a bit more. Um, to analyze time series, you you can have like very basic things, uh, like for example these two articles that are like basic linear modeling techniques uh, that comes with also a lot of um, a lot of issue because there is nothing linear in. Uh, in the in the different processes I show you, so it means that when you are trying to apply um, techniques that have been developed for linear system, they do not fit very well with nonlinear one. But still, it's relatively easy to apply, and in some cases, that can give you a lot of very relevant information. And you can also have like way more complex uh, strategy to model how time is interacting um, uh, for a specific process. And something which is um, something that you will see a lot in the literature is this name of um, time varying uh, time varying vector to aggressive models. So um, let me just give you two outcomes of uh, time varying auto aggressive models to have an example. Um, here you have a network of temporal association between uh, symptoms that are related to a state of depression. So using a um, vector autoregressive model, you can see how one specific symptom is related to the other symptoms after controlling. Um, yeah, basically, let's say that we, you can check the interaction between a lot of different symptoms with a time series. So it's very interesting because if you have like a client, uh, let's say that have a very central symptoms. So uh, for example, like self-esteem is very central for a client. You can check whether a change in self-esteem will impact all the other things and maybe lead this person uh, to an undesirable state. And here it's another kind of outcome that you can get from vector autoregressive model, which is also, I think, very interesting. Um, here, for example, you have the change in uh, depression related to the time in bed. And what we can observe is that when you have a one uh, standard deviation change in uh, depression, you spend more time in bed during up to, let's say, four days. So it means that if you have a surge in depression for this participant specifically, uh, when this participant has a surge in um, in depression, he will spend more time in bed during four days, and then it will come back to the, to the like the association will, will no longer exist. So again, this is super interesting to, to, to get into the detail of a specific, uh, specific process. Um, again, a lot of the resources that I used for uh, for this talk are available in this paper, so I encourage you to to check it. And they are also like sharing all the data materials, and they are working with a specific R package, so you can see a lot of um, example and things here. There is also this uh, this book, which is very interesting, but I think you will discuss the specific concept of N of one trials with Olga, so I'm not gonna uh, spoil her. And there is also this online uh, interactive course uh, with an R package called MGCV um, to run a model which is called Generalized Additive Model. And if you have to deal with time series, this is a great option. And uh, it's a pretty nice interactive course. So again, if you have some time series and want to start playing with it, uh, doing this interactive course, which is free, obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a good idea. And again, on my um, OSF, uh, so Open Science uh, Framework Platform, um, I have been working with a colleague, uh, Dario Barretta, to develop um, to develop like a, a toolbox for time series analysis. So we have a relatively easy uh, easy to use uh, air code to run a different kind of time series analysis that you can use uh, whenever you want. And obviously, there is the data that comes with. So if you need example. Uh, it's also uh, part of this uh, of this, and uh, and here we are. So yes, thank you. I'm done.
Thank you. Thank you. It was great. So could could we invite the audience to ask any questions that they might have, any comments about the presentation? And while while people think about that, I wanted I prepare a question for you. So in one of the slides you mentioned about the complex theory, and I was and I was wondering about in that question when you mentioned complex systems, are you saying that the complex system in that case is the behavior being studied or the relationship of one thing? Or are we saying this is the complexity of the human body? So I wanted to understand in what in that context. Yeah, yeah, great question. Is, yeah. But no, most of the time the complex system will be the human. So if we are interested in human and this complex system will be made of a lot of subsystem. So your sleep, your eating behaviors, your stress level that are also complex in a way, because if you take a piece of this complex system, they are also complex because of the things I told you, because they have a lot of long term memory, because they have a lot of abrupt change over time. So you can split uh, or zoom in this different complexity. But most of the time, the, 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 you take the big picture and the big picture is for us. For me, most of the time, it's the it's a person. Person is a complex system. And I'm trying to enter into specific complex system of this complex system. But as I tell you, for example, there are a lot of papers using exactly the same analysis that I show you for civilization. So mm -hmm. trying to predict a collapse in some kind of uh, old civilizations mm -hmm. uh, based on indicators uh, that are part of this civilization. Yeah, which would be much longer time scale than those changes mm -hmm. in the Obviously. human body, right? Obviously. Okay, let me just see if we have any, if anyone has any other questions. If not, I'm going to go through the list of questions. I think uh, Wilson, Emma, Emma, you have yeah. a question? Go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, so I was just going to ask about um, sampling. So for like time series data, like your sampling frequency is really important. But when you're yeah. starting to look at human data, sometimes you've got the burden on participants so for your example like i feel hungry so that there's a burden of the collecting the data and there's also the fact that you might not get uniform sampling because you're kind of only getting the data when people um kind of respond so i wondered if you had any thoughts or anything on your toolbox on how you can kind of deal with that or how you can choose an appropriate yeah. um, it's a very good um, very good question uh, emma so um uh, I'm pretty lucky because I'm, I'm interested most of the time in physical activity, so I do not need to ask anything to get high resolution yeah. data. But it's true that when you want to to monitor like self-report things like uh, yeah depression level or things like that, um, it's tricky because you might want to ask a specific question up to five times per day. And at the end, you will increase a lot the burden of the participant. So here you can play with the time length. So for example, you can choose to only ask once per day, but during a long time, or you can choose also sometimes to include measurement burst into your study and to, to tell to your participant, okay, so we will like measure intensively some stuff for you, but this will only last one week. So let's do it during only one week. We will ask you like several times per day, and then we decrease the sampling rate and we come back to something different. And I think it's what people are doing most of the time, measurement burst, because you can have like the different sampling frequency uh, with self-report measure without uh, like being too uh, annoying for the, the participant. But I think it's also something you will discuss with Olga because she's really interested in the this concept of engagement. And uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's crucial to think about the impact of uh, what you ask to to your participant. So no, Thank I do you. not have a great solution for that, Emma. Basically, at the end, it's always a, it's always an mm. issue you have to deal with. I will say, if you want to observe a process that can change a lot within a day, I will decrease the study the study duration. So basically, okay. I will only ask the participant to participate during two weeks, and I will not do something longer. Uh, also, something um, when it comes to statistics, it's always more easy to analyze data that have the same amount of time between each point of your time series. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you are collecting things randomly, so let's say at 8 a.m., then at 10, so there is two hours, uh, then at 4, so there is like uh, more hours. Um, 
I don't know why, but from a mathematical perspective, there is a lot of assumptions that uh, do not work anymore, and you cannot, you can't, you can't apply all the model you want. So it's better also to think. For me, for example, I I like to think at the daily level. So sometimes you are missing information because things could change between one day, but still at the daily level, it's also more easy to interpret. You know how you feel today comparing to tomorrow and the day before, etc. So um, you, yeah, thinking about the scale is very important. But there is no good solution. It depends of uh, it depends of what you want to do. Okay, thank you. Jeff, one one quick question that I was. Oh, Jeff, do you have a question? Go for it. Oh yeah, sorry to to interrupt you. Um, I I just actually had something to add on to that. I was wondering like. Are there like there seems like there's some types of data that are that don't have fixed intervals between them. Like for example, time you go to bed. Uh, it's not like at every day at 10 p.m. you want to check, oh, are you sleeping or not, right? You, instead, you want to report like, oh, I went to bed at like uh, you know 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. versus 10 p.m. So then the intervals become a little bit different. Is there a way do you have thought to handle that? And then my other question. Uh -huh. Um, I don't think so for this specific example, Jeff. I don't think that you have any trouble because it's each day you go to bed to a specific time. So um, in the analysis, I don't think that it's a uh, specific trouble because, for example, you will have day one, uh, let's say uh, 3 a.m. for you today or 4 a.m., uh, day two, uh, another value, etc. So in this specific case, I don't think that uh, it's... Um, there is specific issues about uh, going uh, time in bed. It's more it's what more an like, issue basically yeah. when you have like within day data collection. Yeah, but what about for something like walking, right? So you might walk multiple times a day. So you actually do it's like an event based thing rather than like intervals. Would you record it as like um like this day you report you I walk like at three p.m. and four p.m. and seven p.m. or how would you treat that? Yeah. In um, most of the time I'm working with data that I uh, average at the daily level. So for example, like I remove your sleep time and I only keep the time awake. Then I compute the, the physical activity uh, data for this specific uh, awake time and you can control this awake time. So I'm like avoiding this issue. And otherwise within day, again, I think you will see that with Olga, but something you can do, for example, in micro randomized trial, is to only focus on, uh, let's say, like the 30 minutes or one hour after a specific intervention. So if you are sending notification, you can just average the number of steps that someone did after receiving a notification. So in this case, same things, like it's more like an answer to an outcome. So you are you are avoiding this issue. But otherwise, I'm, I don't know. I, I will have to think about Jeff. I'm not sure. You can send me an email if you have a more like specific question or problem with your data. I can try to think about. But because like that, I'm, I'm not sure to to see any specific troubles. Yeah. Oh, thanks. No, I think it makes sense. Just to, it's like to aggregate it at like the day level um, when possible. I, I, but I'm also yeah. curious about like um, uh, in in lot some studies you often have like missing data, and I feel like in the examples you showed that. Like, it was like very clean, right? Are there some sort of analysis that is more robust to having missing data or have you looked into like what to do in, in yeah. those cases usually? So um, it's uh, most of the time, it's not uh, it's not great to have missing data in time series. Um, in my OSF uh, Open Science uh, Framework uh, page, uh, if you download the code, the toolbox that I presented at the end, I implemented different uh, missing data uh, uh, like imputation method to impute uh, to impute data for time series. Um, it depends because, as you say, there is some um, statistical tools. So, for example, generalized additive models. I think they can handle pretty well the missing data. So, obviously, if you do not have too many of them, uh, you can just go ahead without imputing. But for other things like the complexity indicators that I show you, you need to impute your data first. But which is pretty good with time series is that you can directly see the imputation and you know if your imputation methods make sense or not. Because like, for example, when you have specific variation and when you see that your imputation is totally like uh, destroying the, the process, uh, you see that it's not the good imputation method. And because there are like 10 of them, you can test like the one that fit the most. And uh, actually for physical activity, for example, uh, we implemented some that worked very well. So when I say works very well, 
you can feel that it's not totally modifying the pattern of uh, fluctuation. Something I do also in the papers I show you is that most of the time I apply the filter before uploading the data and I remove the participant with, let's say, like more than a specific threshold of missing data or when the data are all accumulated at the same time. So someone is wearing the device like a very, uh, very, um, like uh, in, in a good way, but you will remove it during one week, for example. It's just, you know, it's a different kind of missing data. So um, yeah, good point. It's 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 tricky, but you have a lot of tools to to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it feels like there's sometimes there's uh, just different meaning behind it. Like sometimes it's missing for a certain reason, and it's by it's a as you if you just impute it, it just treats it as the average. Whereas maybe like if you have what day of missing walking data, it might just because uh, they got sick and then didn't do. Uh, yeah, any actually. Data. For example, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, so the, the the trends I show you, I show you. So we we observe like a big decrease in the physical activity level, but we also observe a big decrease in the wear time. So it means that the participants were not wearing their their device anymore. So we try to filter a bit and to remove the participant that stop wearing uh, wearing it. So for sure, like for this kind of devices or anything like checking at the pattern of missing data will tell you a lot about uh, what is going on. Great, thank you. And thanks for the great uh, list of resources during the talk, there uh, I took some notes. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, it was a lot of things in a, in a short amount of time, so do not hesitate to, to come back to me. Thank you. Jeff, yeah. and it would be great if you have some of those links to share them with the group in a Slack later, as you mentioned, okay. there was a lot. Is Are there any final questions, any comments? This is your last chance for a question. Three, two, one. Okay, finish here. So thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was great. And uh, thanks everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you, Josh. And I will put some stuff on the on the Slack channel. Great. No worries. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao everyone.